Welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast, the resource for transitional and experienced genealogists who want to create a successful business. I'm your host, Miriam Pierre-Louis. Here you'll learn from professionals all around the world who work in the field of genealogy. Are you ready to get started? Then let's get going. Welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast. Today we visit New England to get to know genealogist Mary Tedesco. Mary, welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast. Mary, and thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Let's get started by having you tell us about yourself, and let's dive deep. I want to find out where the seed for your genealogy passion started, and then transition us to how that became a business for you. Of course. So first, just a little bit about myself, as you asked. Uh, My name is Mary Tedesco, and I am one of the co-hosts on the PBS TV series, Genealogy Roadshow. And I'm also the founder of Origins Italy, which is a genealogical research firm specializing in Italian and Italian-American research. Seed was planted pretty early in my grandmother's kitchen. She and my grandfather, who were both from Italy, used to tell me stories about folks that had been deceased for a long, long time like their parents, their grandparents, and even in some cases, their great grandparents. So these stories really had a lasting impact on me. When I was working in the financial industry, a colleague clued me in to just an amazing thing called genealogy. So I had been curious about family history, but I didn't have a name for it yet. And it turned out to be genealogy. So I was introduced to online genealogical research. And from there, of course, I took the research local. I was doing genealogy quite you know, voraciously, I would say. And then I began taking professional clients. And then eventually I branded my business Origins Italy. You had this childhood, wonderful childhood, it sounds like, where your family is reinforcing your culture and your heritage. And it's sat dormant like it does with so many of us until we become adults and, and we, we want to be curious and explore. While this was sort of developing in you, what were you doing in college? And then, you know, what, how did you start your career? Because I think that it was probably very different from what you're doing today. Correct. So I had always had a love and passion for Italy and the Italian language. So when I was 16 years old, of course, just a teenager, my parents and my paternal grandmother took me to Italy for the first time. And we were in Rome where my paternal grandmother, Loredana, had grown up. So she basically took us, Marion, on an ancestral tour, which I didn't know what it was at the time. But we took a walking tour to see her old houses in Rome. And she enlightened us with stories of Rome during the war before it was open city. And there was a a real threat that somebody could be bombed uh, from above and potentially die. And she had a couple of close calls because her house was actually bombed. So she showed us where the old house was that she had experienced this just horrific incident during wartime in Italy. So that was really a heritage walking tour given by my grandmother. During this time in Italy when I was 16, I also met my Italian cousins for the very first time. And I couldn't communicate with them because I only understood just a little bit of Italian at the time. But I was inspired at that point to learn the Italian language. And again, this is way before I knew that there was a wonderful thing called genealogy. And this, in the end, of course, is extremely helpful for me and what I do as a career. So when I got to college, just with the passion of Italy and the Italian culture and language, I learned Italian. I took 11 Italian classes, both at BU and through a study abroad program through SUNY in Stony Brook in Rome. And my Italian language skills really developed. And language learning is, of course, ongoing. And every time I return to Italy, the language just gets a little bit better and a little bit easier. So it really started there. And then from there, of course, Italian genealogy was just a really great fit. Now, what did you study in college? Because it wasn't related to history or genealogy at all. It wasn't. Of course, I always had a great love of history all throughout this period. I have to say that, of course. But I did study pure mathematics, believe it or not, in college. And I really love problem solving, Marion, and that's one of the reasons why I chose this major. I've always been a math person or a science person, which is the great love of being able to take a very difficult problem or situation and work out a proof for it. 
And now looking back, that's a perfect fit for genealogy because in genealogy, we're looking for evidence. We're looking for proof. We have to back up our claims to an ancestor or to a situation or to the next case. So it turned out to be just a wonderful fit and great training for genealogy. But at the time, of course, I didn't realize this. So what was the attraction to math? Is it just something that came easily to you that you enjoyed? I mean, did you just did you honestly just go to college and say, I love math so much I want to major in that? I mean, as someone who really is deficient in this area, <laughs> I just want to I, I you know, it's you're alien to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to give a shout out to my favorite high school teacher, Mrs. Veridakis. She was incredibly inspiring to me. Uh, she had the coolest class in school and also give props to my high school chemistry and physics teacher, Mrs. Berganti. Those two ladies really inspired me to want to be a better mathematician, I guess you could use the general term, but just to love math and science. So coming off of that experience in high school, incredibly inspired me to want to pursue mathematics in college. And really, that's that's the root of it. Interesting. Now, I only caught a little bit of the first episode of uh, Genealogy Roadshow, but weren't you kind of talking about something scientific to one of the guests? I certainly was. And that was an incredible story of a lady, Janet, one of our guests, who had a question as to whether her grandfather witnessed the Trinity test, which was the first detonation of the atomic bomb. So, of course, because it had to do with science, I was interested immediately when I saw this story. And our producers are really wonderful in matching us with stories that closely or dead on match our interests. So it gets my co-hosts and I I even more interested in telling a particular story. In this case, this was something that I was just fascinated by. It's a wonderful story, and Janet was just a lovely lady to meet. That's really interesting that you get to sort of pair your other interests with the stories that pass through Genealogy Roadshow. I didn't realize it went to that level, and, and that's kind of cool to know that there is that aspect of the show. Yes, because, of course, my two co-hosts and I, we each have different interests and different expertise. And I, I really give props to the producers and our PBS team for matching us so well uh, with both folks that we'll you know, get along with and like very well as the guests and also subject matter that we're fascinated by or want to learn more about. And to me as a host, that's a really special part of being with the team at Genealogy Roadshow because they do this for us. It's really a cool thing, and I, I can't wait to learn more uh, about the next set of stories. Generally speaking, do they know this about you and that they know the interests of all the co-hosts? Or is it a situation where a particular story comes along and you say, hey, I have an interest in that because of X, Y, Z. Can I follow up on that one? Um, well, actually, both situations have happened, Marion. I mean, these days after I've been with the show for now two seasons, the producers and the production team know us all pretty well. So they know what we're interested in just based on conversations and traveling together. And, you know, they, they really do their best to to find things that we're most interested in. Or, of course, if I happen to see a story, I'll say, hey, you know, do you mind if I grab that one? This is a, a really cool thing. I would like to know more about it or I have an extra expertise in that area. So I think doing that really enhances the show and enhances our ability as hosts to tell the story and makes it even more special. And, of course, every guest that comes on the show is special. And I want to give them a, a great experience because we as hosts get so invested in their stories after hours and hours, both of reviewing the story and practicing to go on the show and also co contributions to research in some cases on the story in conjunction with our research team. So it really becomes part of our story as well to present this to the guest. I really love this whole math and science aspect of you. And I hope, you know, as I watch you develop your career, because you're really, you're just starting out in terms of you got so many years ahead of you to do great things. I really look forward to watching you incorporate this math and science aspect into everything that you do, whether, you know, whether it's TV or genealogy or what, because I feel like you ha you're in this position to really inspire young girls to latch onto that and to become interested in it. I mean, it could be incredible. 
I appreciate you saying that, Mary, and thanks. It's a, it's a very high compliment coming from you. And it would just make me, you know, thrilled to be able to inspire folks, uh, young people, young girls, especially like I was, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, or whatever, to pursue both study and careers in mathematics and science and, of course, in genealogy, because that's also something that I love very much and that would be a great career for somebody coming up through school or in high school now, grade school. So that just makes me so happy when uh, younger students write to me and they say, Mary, I'm, I'm really interested in this or that. I saw it on the show. That's like the best kind of email I could ever receive. Lots of great potential there. All right, so let's move on from college. You're into math, you're into science. So what happens after college? What do you do? What do you do for work? So uh, after college, my first job was at State Street Bank as a fund accountant, which was really utilizing, of course, the math side of the brain. And I just had a wonderful experience there. And while I was there, I received uh, a job offer to go and work for Lehman Brothers Asset Management as uh, a fixed income research analyst. So when folks ask me, where did you get some of your early research and analysis training? It was at an investment bank. They had a wonderful program, you know, in terms of on the job training in order to research these financial securities where there were millions of dollars on a line. So I was part of, of course, a larger research team because I was, a, you know, a younger person that was responsible for analyzing uh, fixed income securities for money market funds. So it was a cool experience to be able to research something when there was so much riding on it in terms of, you know, clients' money and client assets. So I really equate that to what I do now. I research each client's genealogy for Origins Italy, just like there was, you know, millions or even billions of dollars on the line, just like back at the bank. It's an unusual background uh, for a genealogist. I'm not saying there aren't other genealogists who have backgrounds in finance. I mean, you find a lot of lawyers uh, who, are, who go into genealogy, but uh, not too many finance analysts. So you had mentioned that you were working at one of these companies when one of your coworkers introduced you to genealogy where you started to really explore it. Where did the thought process come in that you thought, wow, I'm going to leave this whole finance industry. I'm going to open up this company and do genealogy <laughs> research. How did that happen? Well, um, you know, s some of whom who are familiar, I guess, with some of the financial history, Lehman Brothers actually was uh, one of the major companies that went bankrupt during the crash back in 2009. And what happened there was your entire world as an employee kind of gets turned upside down. And naturally, you kind of think, well, what else could I be doing? And at the time, of course, since I was introduced uh, to genealogy by a colleague at State Street at that time, the genealogy kernel was already there, Marion. So after Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, I got a job uh, for Bank of America uh, Global Capital Management, which at, which at the time was called Columbia Management. And I was doing a, a similar thing uh, with uh, money market type securities in the investment world. And at that time, uh, genealogy really almost exploded because at the time that particular division was going through a split and part of it was a merger. So there was a lot of uncertainty, not just for myself, but for a lot of colleagues in the financial world. So I think a lot of us were like, well, let's do an evaluation of what I really love to do. You know, is this what I want to be doing? Of course, I love finance. I, I, I still invest my own assets, but it's like, what, what do I really want to be doing? And the thing that I would wake up and think about was genealogy. And this is almost basically for the last 10 years. And I was thinking, I said, well, could I actually do this as a full-time profession? Is that possible? And in terms of, you know, interacting with various colleagues, both in genealogy and not in genealogy, the, the consensus was kind of up in the air. Some said, yes, do it. Some said, oh, you'll never be able to do it. So there was really a lot of mixed opinions. So the best way to find out whether something is possible would be just to try it. But of course, approach it in a very methodical way, because this is a business, you know, and you want to make it a business. Of course, nobody goes into business not to be a success and not to have their business, um, you know, go forward. 
So I, I tried it and my business is continuing to evolve. You know, it has evolved, of course, from the beginning. And I'm always open to suggestions from colleagues. And I've had a lot of uh, wonderful mentors, both within the genealogical industry and outside of genealogy and other industries. And they have inspired me to continue to evolve my business and to look at new horizons and opportunities. And of course, Genealogy Roadshow is one of those. And I, I continue to progress forward. And I think the future is very exciting. What that means exactly for me, who knows? But that's part of what makes life exciting. I know that no matter what, I will always be doing genealogy. So let's go back to that time when you're formulating, pulling together the this business, what are the first things that the steps you're actually thinking of doing? Like, do you do a little market research to determine whether it's viable? Do you attend professional meetings? What, what actual steps did you take first to determine whether you should go forward with it? And then once you said, yes, I'm going to go for, for it, what do you do to propel yourself forward? What Give me some concrete steps. Okay, so the first thing is education, education, education. Early on, before I branded my business, I began going to genealogy seminars uh, quite religiously, actually. I went through in early 2011, the first semester of 2011, the Genealogical Research Certificate Program at BU. And this program was instrumental in helping me to formulate uh, my career as a genealogist and showing me that it would be possible. I met some very long-lasting friends and mentors, both as faculty of that program and as classmates in class. And we expanded upon that. And I've met wonderful other alumni at BU that have inspired me. And I hope that I've also inspired and encouraged. It's definitely a give and take. So that was an instrumental piece in my development. I continue to attend genealogy conferences and seminars both uh, locally and nationally and continue to do so, of course, as well as uh, institutes like the Salt Lake Institute of Genealogy out in Salt Lake. So I would say education is the first step in formulating, you know, whether genealogy is the career for you. So you have to bring your expertise up to another level. And of course, as professionals, this continues to just get better. You know, education never stops. Education is for a lifetime. So that's the number one most important thing. The second thing I would recommend would be to take a, an informal poll on your own and make some notes about what are the other folks in the industry that are doing a similar thing or the same thing. And as a business owner, you want to make your approach just a little bit unique. So each person, whether they're doing a similar thing or the exact same thing, brings different skills and expertise to the table. So you have to think, well, what makes you unique in how you approach this, which is different from anybody else? What makes you special in this way? So you have to really take a, an inventory and do your best to show others, um, whether it be through outreach or social media or your own blog, show others what's special about how you approach this particular subject in genealogy or actually in life. When you were going to these conferences, because I have to say I was at those conferences, you mm -hmm. stood out because you were tall and young and very noticeable. How did you feel at those conferences in those early days before you were really a full part of the community, when you were getting introduced to the community? What, was, what were people's reactions to you? Well, I, I mean, it really ranged from, you know, the humorous to the, the, of course, you know, meeting very supportive people that I'm, I'm very honored to call my dear friends. So I, I remember just a story at one of my earlier conferences, and I had been chatting with a, an older woman, and then another lady came up to me and said, it must be fun to attend conferences with your grandmother. And I, and I said, well, my, my grandmothers are, are actually at home. I said, that's a, that's a very nice lady that I just met. But, you know, I took, of course, no personal offense to that. And I, I did my best, of course, not to offend the person that was asking. But I, I think it's it was a natural question at the time to ask a, a mid 20 something, I guess you could say, at a genealogy conference. But we as genealogists need to be aware that folks of all ages, especially now that 
genealogy is getting a ton of exposure. Folks of all ages could be interested in genealogy, whether they're, you know, six or 66 or 88. All folks could be curious about their ancestral roots and want to learn more, whether it be from a seminar or a conference. But um, I just love stories like that. And it's a, it's a very endearing part of, I guess, my start into uh, genealogical education or early on in my genealogical education. There are more and more younger people in their 20s getting right. into genealogy, getting into professional genealogy. So really, it's changing. I mean, I work I work with a lot of people who are really trying to make a career out of this, either part-time or full-time, and they're in their 20s. So it, it really is changing. But it's funny because I remember seeing you for the very first time. I didn't meet you that first time, but I saw you and I was like, wow, who is that? <laughs> you know, like you do stand out and, 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 and it was just so strange, <laughs> you know, like, but I mean, when I started, I was in my thirties. God, it goes so quick. But anyways, all right. So let's move on from that. Origins Italy, the name, the company name Origins Italy. I, I've told you before, I really like the name. I think it's, Thank it's, you. it's a perfect name it, in every sense. It's short. It's straight to the point. It ties back to people's sentimental uh, connection and attachment to their homeland, which happens to be Italy. But that said, coming up with a name is one of the hardest things for genealogy professionals to do. Talk to us a little bit about how you came up with the name. Was it an easy thing? Did you just like one day say, oh, it's Origins Italy? Did you talk to people? How long did it take you to come up with that? I would say conservatively, it took months to come up with the name Origins Italy. I have, you know, both my dad, who's a, a businessman and um, several family friends who were also involved in their own businesses that were part of my brain trust in coming up with the initial stages of this business and setting it up correctly. And uh, of course, there are mistakes in any business, but I, you know, setting it up right, finding the right name, finding the right website address. I consulted uh, with experienced individuals, and I still do, that are able to advise me on various aspects of the business and how it would be properly set up, including, of course, the name, because that's the first thing that people see. And after months and months, and we went through, I don't know, I think 50 or 100 possibilities just in terms of brainstorming. I still have some of the old notebooks with all of the, the variants of the name. And finally, one day, I just looked down at my notebook and there were you know, probably 15 final finalists for the names of the business. And I said, Origins Italy. I said, that'll work. And then, of course, I checked in domain registries to see if anybody already had it. Nobody had that particular name. And I checked social media to see if I could snap up like the Twitter handle and, you know, other social media accounts, which is very important for any starting business, whether it's in genealogy or whatever. So nobody had it. So I started that name, started with that name, basically. It always takes me a couple months to come up with names. So I'm so happy to hear that you went through that too. <laughs> <laughs> Happens to the best of us. Yeah. Now you said you got some outside help to set up your business correctly. And one of which was talking about the name, but what are some of the other things that these people advised you about? Just in terms of business structure. So of course I, I do have an overall LLC that my genealogical, I would say, activities go through. Um, and of course, that was incorporated by a, an attorney. So there are some startup costs, uh, like potential legal fees, just to get you the correct business setup and business structure, which I think is different for every individual. So my structure won't necessarily work for another genealogy professional, although it may. And also to get client contracts done, which is very important, client contracts, client agreements, before you're sending these out to clients just to make sure that on your end, you're covered to the extent that you could be. And that definitely came from going to a number of uh, Ms. Judy Russell's lectures. Uh, she definitely advised me that that was an excellent idea to have a, a good client contract in place. So I definitely did that. And of course, that is an expense to pay the lawyer. But again, this is all part of startup cost. That is an investment in you and your business. So that was that was really some of the good early advice that I definitely took into consideration and followed before I even, I guess you could say, opened the doors online, so to speak. One of the things that's a little bit different, from my point of view anyways, of Origins Italy is that as an American-based researcher, you actually go to Italy quite often, whereas you might have a lot of uh, researchers who specialize in countries in the old world, whether it be Germany or France or England or whatever, but they don't necessarily make trips 
of course, a lot of these are, are based in Salt Lake City, so they, they use mm-hmm. a microfilm. What was it about going to Italy that became an important part of your business? And how soon after starting your business did you start making trips? Was it, you know, did you work for a year or two and then say, you know, I'm going to really offer this as a service? Or out the door, did you say, give me your research challenges, I'm on the next plane? Well, I, I actually took clients to do on-site research before Origins Italy was branded under my own name. So I was given the indications, I guess, from the marketplace, if we're going to talk uh, business here, that that was a need in the marketplace, that people had uh, the, the assurance that somebody that they talked to on the phone was actually physically there. Of course, I, I traveled many times with one to two or you know, it depends on the number of team members to assist me with the research. But it was it was some kind of feeling of, oh, I'm talking to her. She's actually there going through the documents for me and so forth. So that seemed to be just a very positive thing with the clients. Of course, these days, I'm not there for every single on-site research project. However, I do offer personalized supervision. Um, of course, as a business expands, we have to, of course, grow with it in terms of running a business. So that was just a wonderful thing. And I really enjoy being in Italy, of course. So I enjoy still digging into original documents. Microfilm is fantastic. I'm not saying anything uh, about microfilm or receiving the documents from a researcher, but there's something special, Marion, about being on site, tracking down the, the next ancestor of the client, having to think on your feet. It's very exhilarating. And it's something that I know that I will always enjoy in terms of on site research, whether it be in Italy, the United States, or another foreign country. It's just fun. It's like an adventure. Oh, yeah, I, th- I think it's great, too. When I was in my teens and in my 20s, uh, my family had a little trouble bringing me home from Europe. I was there all the time. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, Love it. But having children and a husband uh, has kind of kept me tied. But, I mean, I can certainly see how it's a, a wonderful advantage to and that you can easily incorporate it into your business, you know, if, if your lifestyle allows. So... I definitely. Oh, I would encourage anybody to do that. And I, I just think find it interesting because I see you doing it quite often. So, uh, and it well, and of course, it's a great way to get pictures <laughs> to share <laughs> well, in you your know, blog posts and stuff. <laughs> you know, I love pictures. Yeah, and um, it, it, it's funny. I just I, I really love taking photographs. So I just love to post them as well. And found that people really enjoy seeing pictures of Italy. And these days, you know, I've been to Italy, of course, 16 times, uh, some of which is for client research and some of which is for personal travel. And it's up to 19 of the 20 Italian regions, which is another, I think, unique aspect to both myself and my business origins, Italy, um, that I'm able to share photographs uh, with folks from 19 regions and really say, oh, you're from there. Well, it's pretty good chance that I've been there or been close. I want to touch on language just one more time. Uh, You had mentioned that you took a bunch of classes and that you had done a study abroad in Italy. Since leaving the financial world and opening up your genealogy business, have you taken further language courses or was your language skill already pretty cemented at that point? That's a great question. So I think language learning continues to evolve and continues to get better and better. And my Italian is certainly better from a year ago and certainly better from five years ago. So the Italian language continues to grow and evolve. Uh, In 2013, which I think was... It was either hair before or after I actually opened the business, but was doing research for professional clients. I took a language course for one month in Siena. So that was a a great refresher. I could see myself returning for any period of time to a language school in the future to continue to enhance my language learning skills. Because language learning is really for a lifetime, Marion. And, um, you know, of course, the the better my Italian is, the the better the communication is and so forth. And, of course, this is enhanced by um, native Italians that I have uh, working with my business on a regular basis to supplement my language skills and my ability to communicate. It just enhances everything. So for someone who is doing research in the old country, focusing on the old country, what are some of the advantages that you have as someone who speaks the native language in in terms of your business? How does it benefit your business? I know you just mentioned you can speak directly with your subcontractors. 
what are what's some of the edge that you get because you know is it in the archives what kind of advantage you have it's really nice i have to tell you and really handy that i don't need um, to travel with a, a translator or i don't need to to wait for somebody to interpret what somebody else is saying to me in terms of a genealogical document or of course my uh you know, documentary uh, vocabulary and genealogy vocabulary is, is quite advanced in terms of other folks that may be learning Italian uh, from the United States. So any question about a document, I can, of course, communicate directly with an archivist and uh, be able to ask follow-up questions, which would be much more complicated if I didn't have those language skills in place already. And it's really an advantage, of course, from the United States here to just if you need if I need a quick call to um, a municipal office or uh, a state archive or another repository in Italy, I can just pick up my cell phone and just ask the question. And that's an an incredible advantage. And I think it also yields uh, credibility to to my business uh, that a business as Origins Italy, the person is, of course, of Italian descent, which is, of course, helpful in that you understand your clients in terms of they're just like us. They're just like me, as my great grandmother said, and then be able to say, well, I understand that. Let me make a phone call right now and I'll get back to you in five minutes. Let's talk about Genealogy Roadshow. How did this opportunity come about? Well, I definitely have Josh Taylor and Kenyatta Berry to thank for that, because going into season two, they were looking for a third co-host to join the crew. So both of them very kindly recommended my name for an audition. And of course, I said, oh, of course, I would love to audition for this PBS show, Genealogy Roadshow. So I did an audition for the producers and the PBS team, and they very kindly invited me to join Genealogy Roadshow Season 2 as the third host. And Marion, it's really the best job in the world. Um, we have so much fun together just in terms of our entire team and traveling together. And I've gotten to see a bunch of new cities to me in the United States and learn tons of new things. And I really hope that this will continue in the future. Now, I know how you knew Josh, because you and he were both New England based at that particular time. How did you know Kenyatta? How did she know you? Well, I believe I met Kenyatta. I think it was an NGS, National Genealogical Society Conference in Ohio, if I'm not mistaken, or it was the next NGS. It was an NGS conference. I'm just trying to rack my brain as to which one. Were you speaking at that conference or just attending? I was attending the conference. So you were putting yourself out there going to national conferences as part of your business plan, as part of your overall genealogy thing? Correct. It's part of my continuing education as a genealogist. Exactly. Yeah. So I just want to pause here for the audience, and I really want you to listen to what Mary just said, because Mary got a huge opportunity because she was recommended by other people because she went to a national conference. Networking is so incredibly important to any business, whether it's genealogy or any business under the sun that you do. And unless you get out and meet people face-to-face, opportunities like this might not happen. So that's so critical that you put yourself out there and meet people face-to-face because you never know when an opportunity is going to happen. And just want everyone to reflect on that because making the possibility for an opportunity, you've got to get out there and meet people face-to-face and get to know people and let people get to know you. So just of course. that's my that's my um, soapbox for this particular episode, everybody. <laughs> so, no, I think that's so important. You had a big learning curve because it's not like you came to Genealogy Roadshow with TV experience, knowing how to perform in front of a camera, knowing how to work with a, a film crew. How did you quickly, because you were thrown into the fire, how do you quickly get up to speed with all that stuff? I like to say that, I'm a pretty good listener and I'm a quick study, or at least I try to be. And I really learned on the job in this case and Genealogy Roadshow. And I'm so thankful to my two co-hosts, Josh and Kenyatta, for all of their continued advice, of course, and our entire production team. Because I would ask, like, what can I do better? Or I still do ask that, you know, is this all right? Or should I do it like this or whatever? 
And because, of course, they want to make the best show for PBS. So everybody was so helpful to me and continues to be helpful to me in my journey to become uh, a television person, which, you know, who would have known five years ago that this this was possible. But uh, be, be a good listener. I would advise any of your listeners and always try to do your best. And you can always improve and you can always do better. And I continue to say that about myself, both as a a TV person now and as a genealogist, there's always room for improvement. And I'm always seeking the advice and counsel of uh, trusted professionals, trusted advisors in order to guide me along the way. So uh, my, my ear is always open to suggestion. I know that speaking in sound bites is, is a challenging skill to learn. When you're recording, did you have to learn what length of dialogue to speak in, or do they just let you talk and then they just edit it out? That's a great question. It definitely depends on the story, Marion, I would say, but some of it is, of course, just me naturally talking. And of course, there is some editing uh, in the Genealogy Roadshow program and a lot of other television programs that I know. So I believe it is a combination of both. But of course, when you watch yourself on TV, like when I watched the entirety of season two, you can see things that need to be improved or methods of speaking or, oh, I use too many ums or ahs or whatever. And that's that's a learned skill, Marion. And that's something that anybody can work on and become better, whether they're on television or not, or whether they're presenting for lectures locally Um, at a national conference or anything, there's always room to be a better presenter or a better host or something like that. So I would take the cues and be your own critic and see what you can learn both from yourself and the feedback of trusted others. Do you have somebody close to you, like your father or somebody, a friend that can honestly critique you and provide that feedback to you? Uh, Yes, I am very fortunate enough to have uh, multiple advisors that have been critical in my development as a speaker overall, which would include being a host on television. Yes. You know, even for me doing this podcast, I have my creative producer. He's very behind the scenes, but he analyzes every episode and and he gives me a call and and I just kind of hold my breath waiting for what needs to be changed. And it's a great way to grow. Um, You have to be open to it, and you have to have kind of thick skin sometimes. But, boy, you sure improve quickly. When you have honest feedback, and it usually has to be somebody close to you who you're willing to accept accept that from. So Exactly. Great. Great. And that's a a valuable thing, I think, for anyone like yourself in a, a position to publicly present information. It's very, very important. What about publicity skills? Along with recording television, you are also forced into a publicity role. You're doing an interview now. We would have done this anyways, even if you hadn't been on Jenny Hall, you would show. <laughs> but, you know, you're doing, you know, NPR interviews. Uh, you're doing a lot of different interviews, either for radio, for TV, for print magazines. Is anybody at Jenny Aldi Roadshow giving you guidance? I always wonder about this because, you know, like with professional athletes and things like that, how do people learn to talk the official way, <laughs> so they don't <laughs> they don't run afoul of the guidelines presented by the organization. You know that's you know whether it's the NFL or whether it's genealogy roadshow. How do you know? How do you learn to speak the right way in an interview that appropriately supports that program? I would say that the first thing I would say is it takes a lot of practice on anybody's part that is learning how to do public interviews, whether it be podcast, radio print, et cetera. It takes a a while and it's a lifetime learning experience, just like learning a language to be able to perfect that. I would also say that we have just a wonderful backing from our PBS publicity folks, uh, Goodman Media team, um, Laura Mandel, who's excellent. So we have some very, very talented PR and publicity folks working with us that are, you know, extreme pros. They're, they're just pros in what they do. And they are helpful in providing feedback to us. So I definitely have to give credit where credit is due. But then the other thing is just practice, 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 whether it's in front of the mirror or trial by fire, actually doing interviews. There's definitely things that you can do to practice. You could record yourself, for example, Marion, and then have, of course, as we just discussed, a trusted person, just listen to it. 
you could do mock interviews at home, uh, whether it be with uh, a spouse or a parent or a sister or whatever, that could be very helpful. But it, there, there's nothing like doing the real thing. So these media people, did they run you through dry run interviews or did they just give you pointers like don't say this, do say that? And and on top of that, just to make it more complicated for you to answer this, does anybody, or at least in the beginning, listen to your interviews and say, hey, you can't say that? They're definitely listening, but I, I wouldn't say that, of course, everybody makes mistakes or misspeaks every so often. I certainly have, and I'm sure anyone else involved in the media has, but they will definitely provide uh, valuable feedback when necessary, of course. And now I'm into approaching my my second year of doing the interviews. So I've definitely grown through listening to their feedback overall, but they'll definitely provide feedback as needed um, in terms of improvement or how to get better, which to me is just invaluable. What's the most fun part about being on Genealogy Roadshow? The best part, Marion, is meeting each one of these guests. The show is about the guests' stories, and I have a privilege of presenting this information and being on this genealogical journey with them. So the best part is after all this meticulous preparation and research by our talented research team, being able to present this to them is an honor. And I feel like I'm on the journey right there with them because this is the first time, Marion, that they're hearing this information, which is very special information about their family. I consider what I do to be a very special and unique thing. And it really never gets old because every story is new and unique. And there are different personalities, of course. It's a brand new guest. So it never gets old what I do. All right. We've gotten a lot of information about you, out of you, Mary, and I really appreciate you being so honest and willing to share with our audience about your journey. But I think it's time to give you a break and take it to the lightning round. Are you ready? All right. Let's do it. What was the one thing you were most afraid of in starting your business? Everybody's afraid of failure. What's the best advice you've ever received from someone else? Hmm. Oh, man, this is the lightning round. This is really tough. I would say it's an Italian phrase. It's called sempre avanti, always straight ahead. Keep your eye focused on the goal. Kind of. Right. Is that the exactly. idea? That's the idea. Exactly. Okay. What is one specific action listeners can take in the next 24 hours to help them transition into a genealogy career? Education, education, education. Sign up for a seminar or conference tonight and go. Or if it's online or in person, just do it. Do you have a productivity tool or app that you love that you can share with the audience? Um, I use Excel a lot to sort both client and personal data. What is your preferred social media channel to communicate with your clients? Well, to use my wonderful New England accent that sometimes come up, Twitter. I love Twitter. (laughs) Oh, don't say that. I love it. Oh, (laughs) Yep, that's a Boston accent, all right. (laughs) (laughs) It comes out every so often. Why not? If you can recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be? I was really inspired by Genealogy as Pastime and Profession by Jacobus. It's a great book. If somebody wanted to start a business that focused on an old country, it doesn't have to be Italy, but just any country of origin, what advice would you give them for how they can get started? I would say do all the research you can from the United States, make a rock-solid plan, and go there as many times as you possibly can, because that's really how you learn, is paging through those old documents yourself, being immersed in the culture of whatever country it is. Uh, It's an amazing way to learn, and I would highly recommend that. Give our audience one parting piece of advice, and then tell us how we can get in contact with you. I would say never give up. Your dreams are achievable. Make big dreams, big goals, and go for it. Mary Tedesco, thank you so much for coming on the Genealogy Professional Podcast today. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I love what Mary said right at the end there. Never give up. Your dreams are achievable. Make big dreams, big goals, and go for it. I think it's a good exercise to dream big. It opens you up to all the possibilities that exist. But after you dream big, you need to break up your goals into bite-sized pieces that are easily digestible. Otherwise, you might get overwhelmed with the goals that you set for yourself. So dream big and then help yourself turn those dreams into reality. 
There were a couple of themes running through the discussion with Mary Tedesco. Education was an important one. These days there are so many good educational opportunities, many of which are available online, that there is nothing keeping you from getting started. An interesting skill that Mary pointed out was that she's a good listener. She specifically said that helped her to adapt and learn in her new role on Genealogy Roadshow. I sometimes think that listening can be overlooked as a skill. The next time you're in a learning situation, try to do some active listening and see how that helps you take in what you're hearing. A couple of news items before we end today. The Professional Management Conference put on by the Association of Professional Genealogists, otherwise known as APG, is coming up in September. It'll be held September 22nd through 24th, 2016 in Fort Wayne, Indiana at the Allen County Public Library. This is the first standalone PMC that is not followed by another seminar or institute. As a result, it is bigger and better than ever. It'll be three full days with 27 sessions and six workshops. I'll be presenting three talks myself. They are Connecting with Influencers and Mentors, creating a social media marketing strategy, and three approaches for Facebook page success. Mary Tedesco will be there as well, presenting a luncheon talk about Genealogy Roadshow, as well as a lecture called Genealogy for Love and Money. I hope to see you there and have the chance to meet you in person. You can learn more about the conference at www.apgen.org forward slash conference. As a reminder, I've started a newsletter for the Genealogy Professional Podcast. You can sign up for that on the front page of the website at thegenealogyprofessional.com. That's also your ticket for getting into the free but top secret Facebook group. And lastly, I'll be offering a new class on Tuesday, May 31st, 2016 at 12 p.m. noon New York time. This class is called Who Really Visits My Blog and Website? A Close Look at Web Analytics and Tracking. Most of you have heard of Google Analytics. Did you know that you can use Google Analytics to track your blogger blog and even your YouTube channel? In addition to all the great information that Google Analytics provides, you can take it one step further using a tool called UTM Tracking. It's free, just like Google Analytics, and I'm going to show you how to get started and why it's so powerful to use. And it's not just for professionals. Anyone with a blog, website, or YouTube channel that wants more information about who is visiting their site will be able to make use of this. This is not a free webinar. The cost is $24.99, but it'll take you to the next level. And if you can't watch it live, you can still sign up to get the replay and the handout. And now for our action item. One of the most important things that Mary said was to figure out what is unique about you. That's a critical part of owning a business. What separates you from everyone else that provides the same service? If you're a Massachusetts researcher, what separates you from the next Massachusetts researcher? Is it that you focus on colonial research? Or perhaps you focus on people with Irish heritage in Massachusetts? Or maybe your specialty is Massachusetts military records? Figure out the thing that makes you unique. So your action item this week is to figure out what is unique about you. How are you different from everyone else in your broad niche? And then take it a step further by determining how you can communicate that uniqueness either on your website or your professional profile or your social media profiles, because it won't do you any good to keep your uniqueness to yourself. That's it for this time. Until we meet again, keep improving your business skills and take at least one step to push your business forward. The Genealogy Professional Podcast is a production of Fieldstone Common Media, copyright 2016. Executive producer, Marianne Pierre-Louis. Creative producer, George Edwards. Production assistant, Pam Wolos. Technical director, Jean-Luc Pierre-Louis, Jr.